Hello, and welcome back to My Sex Bios Fucking Capitalism. We took a break uh, over the summer, um, but uh, still made the presentations based off of the monthly theme, so I'm still going to show them to you. We just didn't have live conversations with those, um, but we'll get to that. Um, and reminder that uh, the uh, live presentations and, and involving Q&As and small group talks, those will be starting up again. Um, and uh, as I'm speaking to you, September's monthly theme is uh, Tantra for My Sex Bio. We're going to be looking at mindful connection um, versus uh, uh, the commodification of uh, connection. Um, and we're going to look at that in its uh, relationship to political economy. Um, great. So we're going to move into this one. This the one you're watching right now is inspired by the monthly theme of June, which was aftercare. Um, the way we're taking that is going to be a little, uh, maybe, uh, a little different from the, like, strictly sexual, uh, context of that. Um, uh, but, uh, but we'll move forward. Um, as a reminder, I've already recorded a separate piece on the, uh, political economy broad overall view of capitalism versus socialism. I'll just touch on some key points here, especially as they're related to this particular conversation. Uh, so uh, we'll go there. Um, and then my typical caveat, I should give that. Um, my name is Pierce Delahunt. I, uh, I have a master of education in uh, humane education from, and my thesis was an activist education. Uh, I care very deeply about these things and I am super overwhelmingly privileged and uh, I do my damnedest to leverage that uh, rather than sit on it or weaponize it for uh, harm. Um, and I do not profit off of uh, these lessons with My Sex Bio. All the proceeds uh, that My Sex Bio accumulates or receives uh, from uh, your participating in the live conversations go to uh, My Sex Bio's other staff and, and their uh, uh, operations and, and everything there. Um, I'm just uh, trying to contribute what I can. Um, and uh, I think that's that's that. Great. So political economy, uh, politics and economics, there are two uh, broad ways that that can uh, take shape. Let me get my slides going here. Uh, one is socialism, one is capitalism. Socialism is when the workers control. It's not just anything the government does. Capitalism is when the owners control, not just anything the business world does, um, and they're always in a constant tug of war over the means of production. What are the means of production? Uh, examples include land, education, materials, bodies, and labor being a key one. Um, there is a distinction between private property and personal property. Private property is a synonym for uh, means of production, same thing. Uh, personal property is different. Uh, so this is this is the big thing we're going to be focusing on uh, in, in this particular conversation of uh, the theme of aftercare, inspiring our fucking capitalism theme of uh, restorative justice, transformative justice, and models of accountability. Um, so personal property, for example, is the house that you live in and personally use. That house that you personally live in and use is not a means of production. Uh, you are using it for its use value, uh, which is, you know, a fancy Marx term. Uh, private property is the house that you rent out and profit from. You're not living in it, but you own it and uh, other people pay you rent. That house to you is a private property, is a means of production. The house to the people living in it is a personal property. Um, and so that house is a means of production to you um, and, and to others as well. But it's, uh, it's around, uh, it's about who owns it. Um, so in that context then, uh, we're focusing on that because uh, socialism is about uh, the worker, the, the push for socialism is about a worker control over the means of production, um, which is about worker control over private property, not worker control over personal property. Uh, socialists don't want your toothbrush, they don't want the house you live in, all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, we're going to get into that uh, with, with this conversation. Um, and then just a reminder uh, that uh, there are uh, multiple different kinds of feminisms out there. Um, and there is a capitalist feminism that says, uh, as long as everyone has equal opportunity to climb the corporate ladder, 
then uh, we've achieved feminism, um, hashtag girl boss, all that kind of stuff. Um, and socialist feminism says uh, that's not sufficient. Uh, it, it's not just about who can climb the corporate ladder, because as long as there is a corporate ladder, there will always be people who are being stepped on and crushed underneath it. And even if that person is a heterosis white man, that's still not particularly feminist. Um, liberalism here falling squarely in the capitalism uh, realm of things. Liberalism saying that no poor queer woman of color should die just because she is a queer woman of color, dot, dot, dot but it's okay to die if she's poor or because she's poor. That's what, and there's no conversation about wh how those things are connected and why and that kind of thing, um, or minimal conversation. Uh, so that's some of the broad overview uh, going into that because it's been a while. Um, moving forward though, our theme is aftercare. Uh, that's the My Sex Bio theme of June. Um, I, uh, uh, I know it's not June anymore, but that's, um, catching up on the presentations and the recordings. Um, so June's theme is aftercare, and we're taking that to look at models of accountability, uh, because I think that the question of aftercare in an institutional sense kind of inspires the question, what do we do after harm has already happened? Um, so, uh, you know, aftercare being an important conversation in the interpersonal sense of after uh, uh, there's been a relational uh, activity of some sort, maybe it's sex, um, that there be some kind of accountability to check in with each other. But in, in, in an institutional sense, what do we do after something has happened? How do we check in with each other? What does that look like? And of course, especially here in the United States, but uh, across the planet, um, that's a huge conversation when we're talking about how do we have accountability for harm and what does that look like? Um, great. Moving forward from there. Uh, gotta get these slides. So the main, there are, uh, a couple different reasons that people, uh, cite, uh, prison for, and I would argue that the two that are most at play in the United States system is punishment, are punishment and deterrence, uh, punishment much more than deterrence actually, but those are the two that are most at play. Um, we'll get into the other two later, but, um, uh, we have, therefore, a punitive model of, uh, uh, if you want to call it accountability, I refuse to call it a justice system. I believe it is an incarceration system, uh, and we'll get into a little bit about that. But we have a punitive model uh, for how this uh, works, um, and uh, you're, I think, going to see why at least our version, I would argue punitive models never work, but especially our version here in the United States of a punitive model is not working. Um, so here are some uh, statistics to throw at you. The USA has the highest incarceration rate on the planet, uh, more so than any other uh, nation, um, depending on how you're measuring it, arguably in world history, certainly at this moment. Uh, by and far, and especially far and away compared to all other, uh, like, quote unquote, first world global north uh, uh, fellow NATO member nations, uh, those kinds. Um, so uh, we are looking at in our uh, system, I think it's about two to three million people in the incarcerate, incarceration system, 95% of whom uh, are in that system without having had a trial. Um, and we think of that as a, as an inalienable human right that our country is founded on, uh, that you inherently have the right to trial. Um, but if every single person who has ever tried, uh, pushed for a trial, the entire system would collapse. The entire incarceration system would collapse. Um, and, uh, the most like, so there are some people who are incarcerated, uh, because they can't afford bail and they're waiting a trial. Um, but a lot of people are actually incarcerated because they never had one in the first place because it's actually pretty expensive to go to trial um, and it's uh, gate kept from us. So we have uh, a system uh, of incarceration that is very much dependent on the wealth of the person being accused such that you stand a better chance of walking away free if you are guilty but wealthy uh, than you are if then you have the chance of walking away free if you are innocent but poor. Um, 
And that's what we're looking at. And the numbers are slightly different for uh, state versus federal incarcerations, but they hover around the 95% area. Um, police. Let's talk about police. Uh, police, this is why I wanted to uh, emphasize that conversation around personal and private property uh, in the beginning. Uh, the police, as ruled by the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court has said that the purpose of police is specifically to protect private property. It is not to protect and serve human life. That is literally just a slogan that police departments uh, chose. It's a marketing slogan uh, to protect and serve. Um, and it has, and the police are not required to respond to a call where a person's life is threatened. They can, they are free to decline that, and they have. That was the case that took them to the Supreme Court. Uh, it was, it wasn't a call. It was a subway issue in New York City. Uh, police refused to go in uh, to a specific subway car. They waited until uh, uh, the person had already harmed a number of people. And when that was taken to court, the Supreme Court said, uh, police aren't required to do that. They're only required to protect private property. And this is why uh, the same police that if, uh, if you have uh, squatters who are moving into uh, uh, the 10th property estate or the, the 100th property of a, of a landlord uh, in, so that they can have shelter, um, Police will, will do their damnedest to evict all of them. This is why people who are currently at line three who are protesting uh, the, uh, the warming of the planet and uh, the endangerment of uh, a fifth of the world's water supply as a pipeline that has the, some of the dirtiest fuel that we can have is being built across a fifth of the world's fresh water supply. Um, and uh, and why, in, even though it's violating the Constitution in uh, being built across unceded Anishinaabe treaty territory, um, police are more focused on kicking those people out of the situation so that business and private property can uh, stand, uh, can operate as usual. Um, rather, and you will still see those same police uh, throwing the only shelter uh, or the only possessions that an unhoused person has into the garbage or just destroying it. Um, uh, whether that be a tent or a cardboard box or, or whatever shelter it is they use, because the police exist to protect private property, not to protect personal property. Uh, and that is why that distinction happens. Um, so uh, going from there, then, police have already established that they're not actually required to protect and serve human life. They kill about a thousand humans every year. That is uh, just about 5% of all uh, it's called non-self or non-suicide gun deaths, which actually uh, about double uh, the rate of all uh, gun deaths, whether willful, malicious, or accidental, I believe are the uh, criteria uh, for some of those categories on that, on that website there. Um, so police, uh, police shootings of uh, other people account for uh, more than 5% of all non-self or non-suicide gun deaths. Um, and that's just the shootings, the, the murders that, uh, that police are accountable for, um, that are not shootings are only a little bit, um, but that's, uh, uh, that's still just the shootings. Um, incidentally, uh, police also kill about a thousand dogs every year as well. Um, so there's, uh, uh, ongoing references to that as well. in some of the, uh, the leftist meme culture, you'll see that, um, U S police budgets are uh, roughly $115 billion across the country. Um, that's uh, state and federal. Um, this number is more than many countries' military budgets. Um, and this is why people, uh, in part, why people have been pushing to defund the police. Um, and uh, I want to also emphasize that that number itself is uh, also actually a, an, an underestimate because it does not account for, if you have, for instance, uh, school resource officers, uh, typically their salaries are paid for in part uh, by the uh, police department that is providing the officer, but also in part by the school uh, where the officer works. So some of our education budget is also going to police. Um, and that, that is also true about uh, ROTC and JROTC programs as well, that some of our education budget is going to the military budget. Um, and it is uh, actually defund the police, that movement. Uh, it wasn't 
uh, jobs, not jails. It wasn't uh, care, not cops. It wasn't books, not bars, but it was defund the police uh, and that movement, which is not to discredit all those other movements because they did contribute in building up the momentum and everything, a lot of the, the foundational groundwork. Um, but it was the defund the police movement that actually managed to reduce some funding, uh, still uh, a, a, an incredibly small amount comparatively, I think it was about $15 billion uh, was managed to be uh, defunded from the police and rerouted to other things. Um, thankfully, uh, very grateful for that. Um, but that's, that's the size of the problem we're looking at is $115 billion dedicated to uh, protecting private property over life. Um, great. Uh, police also steal uh, roughly $3.4 billion every year in what is called civil forfeiture. If you're not familiar with that term, that refers to uh, if, for instance, police pull you over and you have uh, some, some cash uh, in your glove box or whatever the case may be, anything that they can argue uh, yeah, we suspect that this happened, uh, that this cash or, or uh, product or whatever it is you have, this property was uh, involved in a crime, we're just going to take it. Uh, that's it. No trial, nothing. Don't need to show any of that uh, information uh, or evidence or, or even kind of any really reason, strong reason why uh, you think that that money was involved in a crime um, or anything, uh, but they will take it. And that is $3.4 billion every year that the police steal from working class people, because to be clear, they're not stealing from the wealthy uh, in this in this situation. Uh, they wouldn't get away with it. Um, and then prison labor is enslaved labor. Uh, you have a variety of, uh, of prison labor kinds of programs that have some degree of choice from one program compared to another, um, but they are all uh, work being done by people who cannot escape, and that is enslaved labor. Um, and uh, that can look a lot of different ways, but that is why uh, every prison built in this country is also a factory uh, or, or whatever kind of service that the labor provides, for instance, firefighting in California. Um, and, uh, and people have leaked, uh, saying uh, sheriffs and, and, uh, uh, jail staff, prison staff have leaked a statement saying things like, um, we can't let these people out because they're too valuable as workers. Um, and that is an incentive to imprison people when we can freely exploit them for their labor. Uh, if they were promised the same uh, working conditions, including pay, uh, that everyone outside of prison uh, can uh, get, which is already not enough, um, but that would de-incentivize uh, the state from incarcerating other people. Um, so that is just a little bit about our current uh, punitive model of uh, quote-unquote accountability. Um, so that's to give some idea of what we're looking at. Um, and, uh, this is my sex bio and we're not just, uh, looking at, uh, uh, private property in and of itself. We want to know how does this relate to, uh, the world of sexuality, um, and, uh, a common, uh, kind of talking point in conversations around defunding the police or, uh, uh, any kind of actual system of justice is, well, what about sexual assault? You're just going to let these rapists run free kind of thing. Uh, well, let's talk about how our current system handles, uh, sexual assault. Um, we have out of every 1000 sexual assaults, 975 perpetrators will walk free. Uh, this information comes from rain. Uh, you can see out of the, the 1,000 sexual assaults, 310 are reported to the police. Uh, 50 of those reports lead to arrest. 28 cases will lead to a felony conviction. And 25 perpetrators will be incarcerated. Um, you can see there's even a drop-off between actually being convicted and actually being incarcerated. Uh, and that happens for a variety of reasons. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein actually was uh, convicted uh but was still allowed to go to work um and he would uh leave and 
and return to uh, jail uh, to and from his work. And people actually didn't even know that he was convicted or in jail, uh, some of them, because uh, he was able to, to show up at work. Um, so that's just one example of, uh, of that. But um, you can see our punitive system of uh, accountability is not actually holding sexual assaulters accountable for much of anything. Um, but uh, even beyond that, we can see, so 97.5% of sexual assaulters are not held what our system calls accountable. Um, and then we have more than 5,700 missing indigenous women and girls in this country. Um, and uh, there's an, there's an over-representation of uh, in, indigenous women and girls uh, who are missing and who are uh, victims and survivors of uh, sexual assault, um, partly because uh, the, uh, the police on the tribal land or the reservations or wherever it is that they are, um, don't actually have a jurisdiction uh, to prosecute uh, a, a person who's not indigenous. So if a, if a white person just rolled up on a reservation and uh, sexually assaulted uh, some indigenous women and girls uh, or anyone, uh, then uh, the, the indigenous police would not have a jurisdiction to prosecute and wouldn't be able to do anything. All they could do is refer that to other people. And partly because of that um, and other things, uh, that is why we have a crisis in this country of missing indigenous women and girls. Uh, and there's a huge campaign around that. Um, and now let's talk about the rape kit backlog. Uh, so if you're not familiar, uh, when a person is sexually assaulted, uh, in, it doesn't have to be full on intercourse, but uh, especially with full on intercourse, there is a, a rape kit uh, that can be collected. Um, and it's meant to secure things like DNA from the attacker, the assailant. Um, and uh, those kits are then put together and they are meant to be uh, sent in for analysis. Um, we currently have hundreds of thousands of rape kits all across the country who are, uh, which are uh, just sitting in police departments uh, that have not actually been sent to any lab, uh, that uh, are not being analyzed for anything. This is allowing sexual assailants to continue because they're not being found, uh, because they're, they're not actually being looked for uh, in the system. Um, some of those rape kits are destroyed without notification to anyone um, and uh, within the statute of limitations. Uh, so whatever the statute of limitations are given uh, the state or uh, uh, county or federal jurisdiction or whatever the case may be, um, if it's you know X amount of time, they may even destroy the rape kit before that time runs out and without notifying the survivor um, and just uh, give up on all that evidence and information. And we have hundreds of thousands. I believe uh, every major city has a significant amount, a significant number of rape kit backlogs, except New York City, I believe is the single exception uh, in the country. Um, so uh, that is just one way that our punitive system is not uh, uh, actually holding any uh, sexual assaulters accountable. Um, and I want to emphasize too that, again, this is because uh, these crimes do not affect private property. Uh, that is why they are not being prosecuted and actually was in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, you can learn more about this from the book Caliban and the Witch, or um, there's an excellent podcast that goes over the book uh, if, you, if you don't want to read uh, a book that's a little more academic than, uh, than, than you might be comfortable with. Um, but in, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism was when uh, we decriminalized sexual assault against poor women. Uh, that was that we did not decriminalize it against wealthy women um, because wealthy women have a, a stronger connection to private property than poor women do. And so that means that poor women have fewer rights uh, under our system. Uh, and that's why uh, the decriminalization has happened. And that's why these crimes are not against private property. Uh, and that is why uh, police uh, and, and uh, law enforcement in general do not actually uh, hold sexual assaulters accountable. Um, the majority of states in the United States allow police to have sex with those who are in custody. This is rape. 
the majority of states allow police to have sex with a person who is in custody. That is not a place, that is not an environment where fully informed and free consent can occur. Uh, in a situation where a police officer may have sex with someone in custody, uh, that would be a, a, a case uh, if someone were to try to file uh, charges against rape, that would be uh, a case where the police officer could say that the person uh, that was in custody consented. Um, and that is just not something that can happen when you are in custody, in police custody, um, under, under the power of the state. Um, that's the majority of states in the country allow police to rape those in custody. Uh, every year, 200,000 prisoners across the country are sexually assaulted. Um, this has been noted uh, that it, it may well be that the United States is the first culture in uh, global history where uh, more men are raped every year than women, uh, which is not to say that it's better, uh, but to say that our system uh, is one that so allows for the stripping of rights if you are considered to be what we call a criminal, uh, that we allow sexual assault to happen to you. Um, and I'm going to argue, uh, and it's not just me who makes this argument, but I'm going to argue that uh, in a quote unquote system of accountability, that allows for 200,000 people to be sexually assaulted every year. Mind you, that's not the number of sexual assaults, that's the number of people sexually assaulted. Um, where 200,000 prisoners are sexually assaulted every year, we're not going to have any other culture than rape culture, if that is the culture we have. Um, if if 200,000 prisoners are sexually assaulted every year, we're living in a world that says, uh, depending on what you do, um, you can deserve to be raped or you can be raped and it will not matter to us. Um, that is a, a culture that is created by that, in part by that. There are other things, of course. Um, so that is some of our current model of quote unquote accountability, uh, both in general and with uh, regard to sexual assault. Um, so now let's take a look at some other models, uh, restorative and transformative. Restorative justice then is an attempt to repair a harm that has already happened. Um, there are the five Ds of disruption uh, that comes out of work from Hala Back. I'm, I'm sure that there are other people involved in that work, but I was introduced to it via an organization called Hala Back. Um, the five Ds of disruption, document, distract, delegate, and direct are four. The one we're gonna be focusing on today is delayed because it is a disruption of a harm that we can do after the harm has already occurred. Uh, and that's what restorative justice uh, intends and attempts to do. Um, so we talked about those two reasons of the current model of punishment and deterrence, uh, establishing that it certainly doesn't do a good job at deterring anything uh, if, if uh, the amount of crime that we talked about is, is still happening. Um, and I would argue that the punishment isn't actually uh, contributing to uh, much good at all. Um, the other two reasons are rehabilitation, which we're going to talk about a little bit here, and incapacitation, uh, which we're not so much going to get into. Um, but, uh, uh, but those are the other two, just for reference. Um, so the five Ds of disruption. Uh, so some examples of delayed disruption uh, include... Uh, I work in a lot of schools, so I use this example, checking in with the person who was bullied or with the person who was bullying. You can have those conversations of, hey, what's going on? Like, uh, what what do you need right now? If uh, they were bullied, like, how, how can we contribute to you feeling safer here? And, uh, you know, checking in that way. The bullier, what's going on? Like, why are you doing this? And how can we get those needs met in other ways? Uh, and, and making sure, you know, th that behavior is not okay. Um, in, in the context of these, uh, kinds of sexual assaults, uh, asking survivors their needs, uh, and, and that can be, that doesn't have to be sexual assaults either, but in all kinds of restorative justice, there is a conversation around what survivors are needing. Uh, and, 
going through those rape kits is a is one a really strong example of how we can apply delayed disruption of harm uh, in and actually uh, provide some amount of justice or, or peace of mind and heart to uh, the survivors um, and, and some people who have also not survived. It's important to name that. Um, another one of my favorite examples of a delayed disruption is reparations, uh, which we absolutely owe and, uh, and need to pay. Uh, and uh, uh, that's just, those are just a few examples of uh, de delayed disruption of harm. Um, so then the restorative justice, the way that the model typically works, uh, and you can see uh, the, the sources that these come from, uh, there's the, the little book of restorative justice is considered a, a very uh, uh, influential piece on this, um, but the four corner posts are what they call the restorative justice are inclusion, encountering, amends and reintegration. Uh, so just uh, briefly on that inclusion being, uh, everyone needs to be included in the conversation. Now that's the person who uh, may or may not have committed a harm. Uh, that is the person who was harmed. And there's also the community at large because the community wants to have, uh, uh, wants to be a part of that conversation. There's an encountering uh, where the different uh, parties encounter each other and that does not have to be face-to-face. -face. That's important to name. Uh, no one is demanding that uh, a person uh, who was sexually assaulted uh, encounter face-to-face -face their, their sexual assaulter, uh, not anyone involved in restorative justice anyway. Um, and then there's an amends process about uh, what, what needs need to be met to help uh, reach some kind of repair. And then there's reintegration is an, a really key part of this for both uh, the people who have harmed and the people who were harmed to be reintegrated into the community. Um, and that's important uh, to name both people because we often, uh, we often shun and castigate the criminals, but then we also often uh, shame and ostracize the, the survivors, especially of something like sexual assault where uh, now that this bad thing has happened to you, uh, you're, you're no longer a, a fully fledged member of our community because you, uh, you contribute to our own feelings of shame or whatever the case may be there. Um, so though that's just a brief look at the four corner posts, that link is an excellent link to get more detail on this. Um, but that, that is just a super brief overview of restorative justice, transformative justice, a uh, little different, but very, very much aligned. Re restorative justice says a harm has happened. Uh, let's try to repair the harm. Transformative justice says, uh, let's try to repair the harm, but then let's go a step further. Let's, let's look at what is it about our system that facilitated this harm to happen in the first place? And how can we change the system such that the harm is less likely to occur? Um, and there's a couple key points in there. Um, the really important thing that I love about this is that it insists that accountability begins before harm has occurred. And there's a couple other ways that I think that that kind of dynamic plays out at an, inter at an interpersonal level. I would say that listening begins before the person has started speaking to us. Um, and in that same way, we're accountable to people before they, they introduce themselves to us, before they start speaking, before we've harmed them, we're, we're still accountable to them. Um, and so that's, I think, the kind of the key insight to transformative justice and, and looking at that systemic level as well. So uh, some things about that then, if we look at ways that we can invest in our community and transform systems, if we provided, for instance, hypothetically, universal housing, food and water, education, healthcare, a basic income and a job guarantee to every person in this country, crime will go down. And not just the kind of crime I wanna emphasize because crime is also a social construct, uh, not just the kind of crime that we think about of like someone robbing from a store or the, uh, the kind of stranger danger stereotype of sexual assault that we have, but all kinds of crime would go down in a world where there is universal housing, food, water, education, healthcare, basic income, and a job guarantee. Um, you're also going to see, uh, fewer people in prison at all which means fewer prisoners being sexually assaulted. You're going to see fewer people being robbed by the police. Uh, you're going to see much less crime overall. The, the very crime of 
uh, someone uh, of, a, of a capitalist exploiting your labor and taking the surplus value of your labor, that would be reduced because everyone would have a universal basic income. There, I, I would argue that uh, houselessness is a, is a fucking crime. And in a world where everyone has housing, crime has already gone down. Um, but uh, it's not considered a crime by the state uh, because, again, crime is a social construct. Um, but again, in this world where we transform systems such that we have this, crime will go down in, on multiple levels, in multiple fronts uh, in that way. Um, so that, that's what transformative justice is about, is saying, okay, so we have uh, this, uh, like, th this instance, right, of sexual assault has occurred. Um, so we're going, we're going to do the restorative justice thing. We're going to try to repair uh, the harm that has occurred there. And we're also then going to try to change the system so that uh, this uh, given instance of crime, sexual assault, occurs less frequently. And I would argue, again, in a world where people are more empowered uh, with housing, food, and education, you're, gonna, you're going to see uh, sexual assault go down amongst other uh, all forms of crime. Um, and that is the transformative justice. So uh, every, uh, every one of these sessions, we do reflection questions. If you were with us live, you would be answering them in small groups. Um, but here in this context, I'm just offering you these reflection questions for you to think about on your own. Um, there's a little tree of contemplative practices uh, to uh, get you thinking about like maybe different ways that you might like to reflect, they don't all have to be sitting in silence. Uh, they can be walking reflection or, or artistic reflection. Uh, I just offer that to you for your own benefit. Um, but so then one of the reflection questions we have is, uh, what repair might I request for harms against me? And how might asking and or receiving those repairs transform me and my relationship to those who harmed me? Um, and I want to emphasize a couple aspects of there, just like the, the general reflection of thinking about harms that have occurred to us and what we might need to help repair uh, our relationships to ourselves and the relationships to the people who've harmed us, if we want that. Uh, I think that can be a really important uh, creative endeavor uh, to get us uh, reflecting on these kinds of things um, and, and how uh, societies might be structured in, in uh, more... Uh, holistic and, and nurturing in better ways. Um, and then also, I think it's really important to name that uh, these things transform us and we can reflect on how they might transform us. It's not just a matter of, uh, I was harmed, so someone's going to do this thing for me and now I can like, you know, do other stuff. Um, but so that kind of interaction is going to transform us in a way that I would argue is actually incredibly valuable and, and part of the value of restorative justice. Um, second question. Uh, so we would do, again, live version, a small group with that first question. This next one. Uh, so before we were thinking about uh, harms against us, now harms we've committed against others. What repairs might I offer or make for harms that I have committed? And how might offering and repairing transform me and my relationship to those harmed? And this one especially, I think, uh, can be incredibly humbling to reflect on. Um, and I'm going to argue that it, this one in particular is especially important and valuable for uh, those of us who are uh, in privileged positions to be reflecting on, is how might we have harmed uh, people, especially in, in less privileged positions uh, or where we have weaponized our privilege in some way, and how might we repair those kinds of harms especially. Um, but of course, all kinds of harms are uh, valuable to be repaired. Um, so those are the two reflection questions. Uh, a little quotation from a radical educator, John Dewey. We don't, I would say, just learn from experiences. We learn from reflecting on the experience. Um, and that's why, and especially I think in conversation and community with others, that can be a really valuable thing. Um, some resources I'm going to throw to y'all. Uh, you have on the left side, over here, some general resources on political economy, especially referring to my sex biosexuality stuff. Uh, so important things there. Um, and then on the right here, we have uh, various resources on policing uh, and, uh, and understanding our policing system. Um, the 
uh, especially a lot of these, like the, the research-based police reform, Campaign Zero, um, and uh, Eight Can't Wait, and police scorecard stuff, comes from amazing work by really, uh, really dedicated people. I, I strongly suggest checking out that stuff, especially. Um, but these are all excellent, really good stuff. So again, I especially emphasize those uh, resources, but the, the, all of these are, are really great stuff. Um, and a little bit of international uh, comparison there at the end with Vietnam, a police state comes from a uh, leftist YouTuber, Luna Oi. Good, uh, good resource there. Cool. Uh, and then the next set of resources specifically around uh, restorative justice um, and especially uh, sexual assault and uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and so a uh, little walk through that. Uh, those first few things there are around restorative justice and some myths about it, because there are plenty of those. Um, Nonviolent communication, uh, which I'm a big fan of, also has uh, a look at models of punishment and reward. And, uh, and it argues that reward is actually also harmful as well. Um, really good stuff to look at there. Um, some of those uh, other things, uh, victim offender dialogue, uh, some as a uh, like a, a little sampling of some of how uh, the victim and the offenders can communicate. Um, Vice on HBO did a really great piece specifically on the issue of restorative justice around sexual assault. Uh, so that that one I, I uh, strongly, uh, encourage people to check out. Dolores Schilling is an excellent Native justice activist. She is uh, pushing the campaign, uh, one of the people pushing the campaign of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, um, which, uh, by the way, that issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and if you remember, it's greater than 5,700 people in the U.S., um, that is correlated to uh, pipeline activity and man camps, quote unquote, uh, where uh, you know, a pipeline is being built across uh, indigenous territory. Uh, and so you have uh, an influx of outsider people who are not accountable to the community, uh, who typically, uh, you know, are uh, white or have greater uh, privilege in general than the, the poor and indigenous community uh, that they have uh, just been thrust into. Um, and when you're not accountable to a community and you have more privilege and power than they do, uh, then you will abuse that. And uh, that has uh, definitely resulted in an increased uh, and is correlated with an increased number of missing, murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, Dear Woman is an anthologized comic book from native folk, uh, all revolving around uh, issues of sexual assault. Um, missing, murdered indigenous women. That's an excellent article. Some more uh, resources there. Um, to, to get you more familiar with those conversations. So uh, excellent stuff, uh, resources, if you want to dig into this. Thank you so much for joining. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I've put my information on, is in the link tree. You can track me down on all the social media stuff there. Um, take a look at the other My Sex Bio stuff, please. Uh, m most of their other stuff is around uh, more uh, applied sexuality, uh, like how can I reclaim my sexual narrative uh, and and how can I reclaim more pleasure for myself, which I think is really important work as well. Um, so uh, all good stuff around. Thank you so much for joining again. Uh, and in solidarity, I'll see you all on the next, next uh, presentation.